So it's been four years since we had all those lockdowns of the initial COVID-19 pandemic. And if I think about it, it's like this hazy sort of sad memory. Um, most of us were at home for weeks, months on end. Hospitals, on the other hand, were fielding these streams of patients who couldn't breathe. Patients who had like lungs and vascular systems just riddled with this virus. And at first, no visitors were allowed into the hospitals. Later on, eh, maybe just one visitor. Then, well, you have to have your vaccines, you have to wear a mask. Honestly, most of us had no idea what was happening on the other side of those locked doors. What happened inside intensive care units is they were hit by all these really sick patients, a lot of them on ventilators. Critical care physician Sabira Valiani witnessed all of this from inside the ICU. And she's our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. Hello, I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and today is Thursday. It's the 21st of March. It's 2024. And today, our researcher under the scope is Dr. Sabira Valiani. Now, she has spent seven years working in the intensive care units at both Royal University Hospital and at St. Paul's Hospital here in Saskatoon. She's an assistant professor of general internal medicine and critical care medicine. And we're connecting virtually today. Of course we are, because that's something we got really good at with COVID-19 and all the restrictions. And those restrictions and their effect are part of the pieces that Dr. Valiani has been looking at in her research. Not just the virtual technology. I mean, that's part of it. But how we can better connect ICU patients and their families with healthcare providers and keep their needs at the heart of that patient's care. Dr. Sabira Valiani joins us now. Hello there, Sabira. Hi, Jen. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, and looking back at your career so far, would you say there was a point at which you were like, okay, I definitely want to be a critical care physician? Like, how did you get to the spot? You know, I think that a lot of this was serendipity and uh, a plan that I didn't even know that was in place. So, you know, I think I went into medical school not even really understanding what I would be doing as a physician. And then going through medical school, recognizing that I probably wanted a career in the hospital, and then I probably wanted a career that didn't focus in on one organ system, but sort of looked at the whole human. And so knowing I wanted to be in the hospital, I knew I, want, I would be seeing sick patients. And so I did a critical care or an ICU elective in Ottawa. And um, that was sort of the beginning and the end of the story. I loved it. I loved on the medical side how you could see the life support that you were giving a patient immediately have a physiologic effect and stabilize or make that patient better. And then uh. on the interpersonal side, it was really, really, really interesting and really, really amazing to work with some of the best communicators that I've ever seen as clinicians in the hospital but also to be with a family who were going through something really, really profound. And often it was, yeah, you're supporting them, but you're also bearing witness to their resiliency and the, their love. And, and that was just truly amazing. And so the rest is history. I looked at it. If you've been in the ICUs for the last seven years, a huge big chunk of that was COVID-19 and this pandemic. That would have hit you like smack right off the bat, just about. Thinking back to like exactly four years ago, those first few weeks and those first few months where we didn't know too much about this virus, what do you remember about being in the ICU at that point? So it was really weird because at the beginning, the hospital felt really empty. And then all of a sudden, it was overwhelmed. Um, initially, everything shut down and we were just waiting for these kinds of waves of patients to come in like they had described in, in the Italian media. Um, and then all of a sudden, these waves of patients did come in, but there was no family. And so 
you had the sense of the hospital still being empty because it was just patients and just the healthcare workers and there was no kind of patient loved ones or family or connection outside. Um, so it was empty and it was overwhelming and it was disconnected all at the same time. Well, um, because when patients would come to you in the ICU, like at that moment, they weren't exactly very verbal. Yeah, not really. Um, because, you know, most of these patients are struggling to breathe. And the majority of the patients who came into the ICU, 95% of them, we actually had to put on a ventilator. And when you're on a ventilator and on life support, you're sedated. And so those patients aren't talking to us. So we don't really know who those patients are. We don't interact with them in a human way. You know, we see their physiologic data, but in the ICU normally, it's families who are giving us that context and that, who is this person that's in front of us that we're caring for as a patient? Oof. So I know that since then, your research has really honed in on that whole patient and family experience. And using a grant from the College of Medicine, you actually looked at the effect of those visitor restrictions what did you find? Yeah, so for that research, um, it was really important to have a multidisciplinary team and patient partners on that team. So we had two patient partners on that team, one who had actually had an experience in the ICU and one who had had an experience of having a loved one in the ICU. And that was um, also um, sort of co-led by Dr. Jennifer O'Brien, who's a patient-oriented researcher in the Department of Anesthesiology. And so with that team and with all of those lenses that that team brought, including myself as a critical care physician, we started looking at the healthcare providers. And we found that those healthcare providers who were living in that pandemic situation were often trying to play multiple roles. They were stretched thin, they were seeing too many patients, and they had to choose between providing the best care to the patient um, and updating the family on the phone. They were being pulled away from the bedside by um, these families who were trying to call in and just try to understand, is my loved one going to make it? Are they going to, are they getting better? What's happening? When can they speak? Um, and then the healthcare providers were also being asked to often um, enforce these visitor restrictions policies that sort of came down from higher levels of leadership and infectious disease precautions and other things like that, that didn't always make sense to them. So they were, they were care providers, they were family support, and they were kind of gatekeepers all at the same time. And so that was awful for healthcare providers. And then we were really encouraged by our team to look at the effects on the patients and their families. And so we went out and we interviewed patients who had been in the ICU and family members who had experienced visitor restrictions during that time. What stands out about what you heard back in those interviews? So from the patients and the families, it was this level of kind of disconnection, like the, the information was just not flowing. And it wasn't flowing between the ICU team and the family, the family and the patient, because sometimes the patients could actually talk. Um, it wasn't flowing between, um, you know, all of those people that we talked about and this broader kind of what we call the caring community or a community structure where, you know, there's lots of people who care about this person who's in the ICU and critically ill and they want to know what's going on too. Yeah, like honestly, I would see Facebook updates from very, very sick friends or from their family members, but that was, it was honestly just social media. Totally, totally, yeah. And so then with that, you don't have a flow of information and the role of the family becomes significantly diminished. And so, you know, even just thinking about a family member going in and holding a patient's hand, that's caregiving, right? Like that's comfort in, in the most basic form of it. And so we even had a story where, you know, a nurse kind of bridged that gap. The family wasn't allowed in the room, but they were allowed to see the patient through the glass. And so a nurse held the patient's hand, touched the glass, and the family member touched the glass. And it was really an emotional story for a lot of our, of our team. So those were things that were happening there um, during those visitor restrictions. And I'm, I'm thinking about the sickest patients are the ones who land in ICU. There are a number of them who will die while they're there. And to have family at best through that glass? I mean, thank goodness for the nurse who's there and able to hold their hand, but that just seems so hard. There were so many stories that just, you know, kind of like 
hit you right in the pit of your stomach, right? Like every, I think, healthcare provider who lived through that pandemic will have stories um, like that, right? You know, we had early in the pandemic, we had an elderly gentleman who was in our ICU and he only spoke Arabic and he needed to be intubated. He needed to go on a ventilator. And so we, we called his family. We video called his family. There were so many people in that room that we called. And I said to them, I said, he needs to be intubated. He needs to go on life support and he'll be asleep for that. Can you please tell him that? And this was early on. We didn't know what was going to happen. And um, I also said, you also need to know that this might be the last time that you speak with him. And it sounds dramatic, um, but I said, just tell him what you need to say to him, knowing that, right? And so I stepped out of the room and I gave them a few minutes. And we did that so many times during the pandemic. And, and honestly, that gentleman passed away. And so I'm glad that we had that opportunity. But the family never got to touch him, to hug him, to be there in person with him ever again, right? How important is that sense of touch? It came up a lot in our interviews with the family. Um, And it came up a lot in our interviews with the patients as well and, and the nurses, you know, like, especially around the time when somebody is dying, there's something about that holistic sense of human touch that just provides comfort or not being alone, right? Like it's, it's both of those things that provides comfort to the one who's passing away, but also really provides comfort to those that are going to be left behind to say, I was there, I was with them on that journey. And so much of that was disrupted uh, during that time. Well, I'm trying to think of how you even narrow down, like, are we talking to this family on Messenger, on WhatsApp, on Signal? Uh, Like, are we on the phone? Are we doing a FaceTime? Like, this is, from there, where did you take what you were starting to find about all these breakdowns when you had all these restrictions and the impact of them? Where did you take that next? Yeah, so a lot of this was kind of understanding what's the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Like there's a problem here. There's a problem that people aren't connected, that they're not engaged as equitable partners in their healthcare, and that their families aren't engaged in a meaningful way. And so the kind of next stage or the current stage that we're at in our research is bringing those people who have the lived experience as patients, as loved ones, as the multidisciplinary healthcare team, and kind of really drilling down and defining those problems. And so this research is co-led by Dr. Salima Suleiman, who's a really experienced and and talented uh, qualitative researcher, and she's also a speech language pathologist. And so she's drilled down those problems, and then she's really asked those people who are living it to think about solutions after we've defined those problems. So I think first we've defined the problems and we, we, we really recognize ICU healthcare providers, patients, loved ones, they're still looking to be connected and engaged. Um, Wait, I thought, I thought all the visitor restrictions were done. um, Yeah, they are. Um, But it's still a problem. You know, I think we, we, we had this extreme example during COVID that, you know, I guess caused me to have a lot of light bulbs go off in my head. But I think that, the problem still exists, right? Like we think about Saskatchewan's population and the populations that are served in the tertiary care centers of Regina and Saskatoon. Patients come, about 30% of our patients come from communities that are not Saskatoon and Regina. Um, You know, families have children, they have work, they have life that happens outside of the ICU and they have to do that while their loved one is critically ill. It's not like somebody can be there all the time and understand what's going on. And so there's really needs to be a way to connect people meaningfully. And so we're kind of looking at communication technology as a tool to start facilitating and in a lot of cases, enhancing that connection between the between the hospital and between the the people who are coming into the hospital. So. What are you finding with this? And I know this is work you're doing in conjunction with the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation, with SHRF. But what sticks out about what you've found so far and where you think that could go? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there, the number one thing is proof of concept, right? There is still a problem. 
people still are reaching for ways to be engaged. And so there's a couple of really interesting kind of solutions that have come out of this. So one of the things is we're talking about effective language and communication supports. So participants kind of talked about, well, what if we could use artificial intelligence or AI to just translate a medical progress note into an understandable family update? The doctor reviews it, they approve it, and then it just goes out to the family. And then your update is kind of done. And the families get that update in kind of a verbal form. They can think about it, they can chew on it, and then they can come back with questions. Or what if you have a family meeting and you record the family meeting and then you use Google Translate or natural language processing and you translate it into the comfort language of the patient and their family. And then they can access it later in that language. And again, they can kind of process it and then come back and ask questions. Well, yeah, because I imagine when you're actually on duty and on call, which you are like every second week, right? When you're on duty, most of the time you would be like you do rounds, right? And that's where if I'm one of the families of a patient, is that where that's where I'd want to catch you? Yeah, totally. Right. And so that's most of our work in the day is we sort of see each patient, we hear about what's happened, we talk to the multidisciplinary team who each kind of gives us an assessment from nursing, from pharmacy, from the respiratory therapist, and sometimes from social work. And we kind of say, okay, these are the priorities for the day. Here's what we're going to do throughout the day. And uh, we'll see at this time where we're kind of at. Um, And at that time, you know, if families are there, it's great because I can provide an update and kind of translate all that mumbo jumbo that happened on rounds and give them an idea of, of what the day is going to look like and whether their loved one is getting better or not. Um, but if people don't have the ability to be there, and that's a lot of people because rounds happen during regular business hours, like it's like trying to go to the bank, you know. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so okay. if, if people aren't there during that time, you know, they might have to try to liaise with the nurse uh, after hours or talk to the social worker and say, can I set up a meeting with the doctor? You know, like we're not really accessible necessarily, even though we try to be, but sometimes we get pulled away from other things. Let alone if I happen to speak Dene or Cree. Right. So using AI could be part of it, being able to condense or translate down, like, here's what I've medically observed. Here's this in a a sort of a human language format that that you can understand here. Your loved one is doing better on this front, but we're watching this. And then you'd have that and you could think about it and then come back with questions. Like, what if I want to know more, but you're gone, you're not doing rounds anymore. Yeah, totally. So we've talked about now the communication can be multidirectional. It can be synchronous and asynchronous. So people can leave messages that would be checked at a certain time. People can... Um, you know, access a repository of resources that are just evidence-based and really um, written in patient-centric language so that if the doctor says we're thinking about a tracheostomy, they can click on tracheostomy, they can read what a tracheostomy is, and then come back with their questions and concerns to the physician team, etc. So reducing the workload because you're not necessarily having to explain as much, but also engaging in a way where the family also feels empowered. Like I know something, I'm bringing something to this. I've thought about it and I've thought about it, what it means in the context of my loved one, which is the most important part of patient and family centered care. Well, I know you mentioned right at the start of the interview, how, how really neat it is as a physician to be able to like give a patient a treatment in ICU and actually see them really respond to it. But at the same time, you might also, yeah, I mean, you got a bunch of families who are in there. They don't want to be there, but their loved one might have spelled out very clearly, please do not go to the ends of the earth to save my life if I'm never going to have the brain function I had again. Um, how much do families sort of factor into, okay, here's the care plan we're going to follow? That's that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think we as the healthcare team and physicians can sort of tell people, this is what you might expect in terms of function or life or abilities going forward. And we're, we're not great at it, honestly. Um, we can do our best, but we're not always 100%, right? We have some right. idea. but the It's fam- like best guesses. Yeah, it's best guesses. And the, it's not an exact science. The family brings an equally important expertise of what 
is important to the patient, right? I had a really interesting conversation with a family. We had a patient who had come from a Northern community. She had come for a life-saving surgery and we knew her lungs were not good. And so she'd made it through the surgery without a breathing tube. Um, She had had a spinal anesthetic. And then of course, her lungs got worse in the ICU and she's requiring more and more and more oxygen. And so I had mentioned this to her daughter and her daughter had been a primary caregiver for her. She had been bed bound for almost a year. And her daughter heard this and sort of assembled this large family. And so we had this family meeting with a lot of people in a room. And I said, you know, I'm worried about her lungs getting worse. And I'm worried that we might need to, um, you know, put her on a breathing machine and make, you know, have her be asleep during that time. And they said to me, you know, I explained my usual thing of this is what it looks like and you're asleep and, you know, this might be the outcomes and stuff. And they said, oh, no, no, no. Like, we already know. We don't want to put her on a breathing machine. That's already been decided. The most important thing, actually, is can we get her home? Because we know she's sick. We know she's dying. And is there a window that you could foresee where we could get her home? Oh. And and you're like, well, I didn't even know the right question to ask in that, right? But they brought such an important expertise as to what does this patient want um, that, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't even see that, right? And so having that family really be involved in care. I mean, we went to extremes with the pandemic, mm-hmm. but even now, making sure families are involved, making sure they have a way to communicate with you. These are all achievable goals, right? Because that's something that strikes me about your research. It it seems like it's really directed towards practical solutions, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, everybody who works in the healthcare system kind of recognizes that there's there's still, it's not perfect, right? And it might never be perfect, but we got to work towards it, right? And so, you know, I think the most rewarding part about this is that we come up with, we have this cohesive approach to defining the problems. And then with those same people who we've defined the problems with, who are living it every day, we start defining some solutions. And so I think that's really appealed to people. And now we can take this to um, decision makers and people who might be able to design systems and other things and say, look, these are the things that people who are living this experience actually want. How can we do this? Yeah, we've documented it. The research is there. Let's make this happen together. Totally. That is so encouraging. I just want to thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast today. That was great, Sabira. Thank you. This was this was awesome. It was a pleasure talking to you. Dr. Sabira Valiani is an intensivist and critical care physician at Royal University Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital here in Saskatoon. She is also an assistant professor of general internal medicine and critical care medicine at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. Now, we'll put a link to her work on the effect of COVID restrictions in the ICU. That is a link to an article published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. You'll find it in our show notes. And Sabira is also leading a team looking at technology and how technology and AI can help enhance patient and family-centered care, especially in the ICU. You can see all the details by clicking on our show notes and by going to medicine.usask.ca. Researchers under the scope of the presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. We record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. This is also where I'd like to thank you for tuning in, for sharing your ears with us. I'm Jen Cannell. I'm your host here on Researchers Under the Scope. And if you can find those three little dots up in the corner and hit follow, Better yet, go tell a friend about one of the researchers they might want to hear about. And that way, if you're following the show, neither of you ever misses an episode of Researchers Under the Scope.